Elder Jeffrey R. Holland was ordained a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles on June the 23rd, 1994. Prior to his call, Elder Holland was serving as a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy, to which he had been called on April the 1st of 1989. His service as a Seventy covered a wide variety of assignments, including that of President of the Europe North Area of the Church and First Counselor in the Presidency of the Young Men Organization. From 1980 until his call as a general authority in 1989, Elder Holland served as the ninth president of Brigham Young University, where he was also a professor of English and ancient scripture. He is a former church commissioner of education, dean of the College of Religion at BYU, and instructor or director of institutes of religion in California, Washington, Connecticut, and Salt Lake City. Elder Holland was reared in St. George, Utah, and it was here that he met his wife, the former Patricia Terry. They were married following his service as a missionary in Great Britain. They are the parents of three children, and Elder Holland received his bachelor's and master's degrees in English and religious education, respectively, from Brigham Young University. He also holds a master's and doctor of philosophy degrees in American studies from Yale University. While studying at Yale, he taught institute and served in a stake presidency, the first of three such assignments. He has also served in the church as a regional representative, bishop, director of the Melchizedek Priesthood MIA, and chairman of the church's young adult committee. Now, brothers and sisters, following Elder Holland's address today, he very much desires to shake as many hands as possible. We will be somewhat constrained by time because of his necessity of catching a plane in Idaho Falls, we're going to have to leave here at approximately 310. So what we'll do is Elder Holland will be down in the front. Those of you who desire to shake his hand, if you will do that as quickly as possible so that as many can have that opportunity, and please be aware that we will need to leave at 310. The last thing I would like to say by way of introduction of Elder Holland is that we have today the opportunity to be instructed by a special witness. I testify that there are apostles and prophets on the earth today and invite the Spirit of the Lord to be here so that our hearts and minds and ears may be opened, that we will be tutored by the Spirit as he preaches the doctrine of Christ to us. Following the remarks of Elder Holland, our benediction, will be offered by Sister Shannon Robinson, a freshman from Plano, Texas. Elder Holland. Thank you, President Bednar. Sister Bednar, we're honored to have you present, and Sister Holland wishes she were here to be with you too, and with all of you. Thank you for your attendance. Even if you knew that I was going to be the speaker, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and our greetings to those of you in the Taylor Building and those of you in the Kirkham Building and those, the two that are holding hands just out by the corner of the campus, our best to you as well. <laughs> they don't think that I can see them. In fact, <laughs> You know, I, I, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck, you know. <laughs> I know. I know why the attendance is so good. He got up early this morning saying, perhaps this is the day. Perhaps I'll just be right where she is. <laughs> And I'll just kind of move this way, and she'll just kind of move that way, and there we will be. <laughs> and so he gets here, he gets here to this devotional, and he says, there she is, there she is. And she's with him. <laughs> yeah. I'm not new to this, you know. I know. I know how it works. Welcome back from Thanksgiving weekend to finals. 
What, uh, yes, somebody needs to work on the calendar, right? <laughs> we do the best we can in these academic assignments. Uh, I want to talk today about Christmas and Thanksgiving and the 1st of December, and not at all about finals. Uh, we are between two wonderful, wonderful holidays. We have just had one and we will soon have another. And both of them evoke wonderful, wonderful feelings of family and home and happiness and uh, gratitude. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, 30 days or so stretching from Thanksgiving to Christmas. I've been impressed that in his very last years, uh, his counselor said of him that President Benson, whenever they prayed as a presidency, just the three of them, it was President Benson, President Hinckley, and President Monson then constituting the first presidency. And I've heard both President Hinckley and President Monson fairly recently reminisce and recall and testify that in the end when President Benson prayed all he did was give thanks. They said they could hardly remember a prayer where he asked for anything. Now I suppose there are things to ask for. You have things and I do and I guess the President of the Church does and, and would. And the Lord would understand that as we go to him with our supplications, but I'm just impressed with that. I leave it with you in the waning moments of a Thanksgiving weekend that uh, as he got closer to going home and as he was older and wiser in his own right and had watched more of life and seen more of God's hand in things, that he simply wanted to be thankful. I ask you not to let that slip away with the weekend, that it not be an event on a third Thursday or, an, or fourth Thursday or however it falls in November, however it fell this year, that you will be thankful all your lives. I'm thankful for you. I'm very grateful for you and for what you represent. You are the leaders of the church that I will one day ere long, not so far from now, walk away from, and that I'll leave as uh, others of the brethren do, and it'll be your church to lead and to guide and direct under the hand of the Lord. And you'll be the bishops and the branch presidents and the elders quorum presidents, the Relief Society presidents and the primary presidents, not simply for my children but for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and generations uh, for me that are yet unborn. And it matters very, very much to me who you are and what you do and how you live. And I'm thankful for you on a day of thankfulness, and I say that to you and would not often get the chance to be here to say it to you. I'm grateful for your parents. I guess the day that I loved most uh, in my BYU years uh, I guess the day I always loved most was graduation day. Not simply because it was fun for the students, but because it was so very wonderful for the parents who sacrifice for you and uh, give to you and do without so that you can have and if there's any group I love more than the students at Rick's or at a BYU or wherever else, I guess the only group that would rival that would be for me to love and say how much I love your parents and those who want you to have a good experience and are doing everything they know how to provide it. I love this administration, President Bednar and his associates and the faculty. I love these priesthood leaders, some of whom are on the stand and many of whom are mixed with you in the audience, branch presidents and Relief Society presidents and people who make your life here uh, what it 
can only be really at a church college. Uh, I have a lot to be thankful for today, and I'm trying to remember President Benson's example. The older I get, and it's not old enough yet, but I'm getting there uh, to uh, remember and to uh, express gratitude. And to be thankful even when on some days it may not seem that life is easy or that it's going well for you or that you might not on any given day seem to have a lot to be thankful for. That leads me forward now from last week to the coming weeks and Christmas. Next week is your Christmas devotional. I think it'll be largely music and I'd love to be here for that. I'd love to hear the music department's presentation. May I just be presumptuous enough because we're now officially into December. May I be presumptuous enough to offer a little bit of a Christmas message that uh, I hope will echo what I've just said about Thanksgiving and will point you toward your uh, return home and your time with your parents, family, uh, whomever you will be with. And there too, in an unusual way, for times that may not be as perfect as you might want them to be. I don't know each of you. I wish I did. It's one of the reasons I want to shake hands with as many as we can, and that won't be very many. But I wish I knew all of you. I wish I knew you personally. I wish we could just talk uh, for hours and hours, if we needed to, about how you're doing and what your hopes and your dreams are, and perhaps some of your disappointments. I know that sounds like an unusual topic in the midst of Thanksgiving and Christmas, but that's my point. That will be precisely the point of what remarks I want to make today, that we must be, we should be, we really ought to be, we're obligated to be thankful and to be merry and to be faithful as we sang, uh, even when that may not be as convenient as we would like, as easy as we would like, even in a season when it's supposed to be more jolly than some Christmas seasons might be. In that spirit, I'm particularly grateful for the, the uh, young woman's chorus, the women's chorus that sang, and the mix of that message to follow him with uh, the Christmas thought that I want to leave. So if you'll bear with me, I want to give you a different kind of Christmas message. My text is from the second chapter of Luke, and you'll all recognize that as the text for the Christmas story. It's uh, the text from which most of our Christmas messages are given. But the passage that I'm going to use from Luke 2 is not a verse we very often hear at this season of the year. Nevertheless, I believe it is at the heart of the Christmas message. I speak of a beautiful moment, approximately 40 days after Mary's delivery of the child, when she and Joseph took the baby named Jesus to the temple. I'll be starting in about verse 29. When she and Joseph took the baby named Jesus to the temple, where the infant was to be presented unto the Lord, it was desirable for all children to be so presented in the temple. But in the Israelite tradition, it was of particular importance to present the firstborn son, a rite stemming from the miraculous days of salvation in Egypt, when the firstborn of the Israelite families were spared destruction. In memorial, all firstborn sons in all of Israel were thereafter dedicated to the service of the Lord, including Levitical service in the temple itself. It was not practical for every firstborn son to be presented there, let alone to render service there. Nevertheless, the eldest son in a family was still claimed as the Lord's own in a special way and had to be formally exempted from his requirement by the pain of an offering or a redemption. 
It's here at this point of the story that we realize just how poor Joseph and Mary were. Think of Thanksgiving, think of Christmas, and think of these two. The standard offering on behalf of such a child was a yearling lamb and a pigeon or a turtle dove. But in cases of severe poverty, the law of Moses allowed the substitution of a second dove in place of the more expensive lamb. Mary and Joseph presented their son to his true father that day with an offering of two pigeons, two turtle doves. This young couple and this son who would save us all. knew what it was like to face economic privation at Christmas time. As they made their way toward the temple that day, the Holy Spirit was resting upon a beloved elderly man named Simeon, one whom the scriptures describe as just and devout. It was revealed to this gentle and venerable man that he would not die before having seen the Messiah the Lord's Christ, as Luke phrases it. The Spirit then led him to the temple where he saw a young carpenter and his even younger wife enter the sanctuary with a newborn babe cradled in his mother's arms. Simeon, who had waited all his life for the consolation of Israel, that's also Luke's phrase, took that consolation in his arms, praised God, and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I'm suggesting to you today in Rexburg that there's a profound Christmas message in the one this dear old man gave to sweet and pure Mary in that first Christmas season. He was joyously happy. He had lived to see the Son of God be born. He had held that child in his very arms. He could now die the happiest man in all of Jerusalem, maybe in all the world. But his joy was not of the superficial kind. It was not without its testing and its trying. In that sense, it didn't have much to do with toys or trinkets or new clothes or tinsel, though these have their Christmas place. No, his joy had something to do with what he said was the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And with this child's life, or at least with his death, which would be a lot like a sword piercing through his beloved mother's soul. We might well ask, was such an ominous warning, such a fateful prophecy, appropriate in this season of birth and season of joy? Surely such was untimely, maybe even unseemly, at that particular moment when the Son of God was so young and so tender and so safe and his mother so thrilled with his birth and with his beauty. Well, our answer is yes, it was appropriate and yes, it was important. I submit that unless we see all the meaning and the joy of Christmas, the way old Simeon saw it all, and in a sense 
force Joseph and Mary to see it, even if they didn't want to. The whole of Christ's life, the profound mission, the end as well as the beginning. If we do not do that, then Christmas will be just another day off work. A little food, a little fun, a little football, a measure of personal loneliness and family sorrow for many others. The true meaning, the unique and lasting and joyous meaning of the birth of this baby would be in the life he would lead and especially in his death, in his triumphant atoning sacrifice. Remember why Joseph and Mary are in the temple in the first place. It would be in his prison bursting resurrection. It is life at the other end of the manger that gives this moment of nativity in Bethlehem its ultimate meaning. Special as this child was, and divine as was his conception, without that day of salvation wherein he would gain an everlasting victory over death and hell on behalf of every man, woman, and child who would ever be born, you and me, until that day should come, this baby's life and mission would not be complete. Worse yet, without that triumphant atonement and resurrection, he might have been remembered only as one born in abject poverty, scorned in his own native village, and tortured to death by a ruthless Roman regime that knew everything about torture and death. But wise old Simeon, who understood all of this, he's an old man. He understood that birth was ultimately for the death, and a death that he was soon to face. It thrilled his soul that salvation was come. Thus Christmas was sobering as well as sweet for him. And so too will most Christmases be for us. Lying among those gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh were also a crown of thorns, a makeshift royal robe, and a Roman spear. I do not want this to be an unhappy message. Indeed, I intend it to be a supremely joyful message, a message of special comfort. But to make it that, I must speak of Christmases and other days in our individual and collective lives that for whatever reason may not be very happy or seem to be always the season to be jolly. For many people in many places, this year, this Christmas, this December, may not be an entirely happy Christmas, one not filled with complete joy because of the circumstances facing a spouse or a friend, a child or a grandchild. Or perhaps that was the case another Christmas in another year but one which brings a painful annual memory every time they put the tree up. Or, and may heaven bless us that this is not to be so, perhaps this may be the case in some future Christmas, when unexpectedly and seemingly undeservedly something goes terribly wrong, when there is some public or very personal tragedy in which it may seem, at least for a time, that hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. By way of illustration, let me share a few examples that I pray are not too painful or too personal for anyone in attendance today. I recall that some years ago, in the very heart of the holiday season, a fire broke out on a conveyor belt 5,000 feet into the Wilberg Mine near Orangeville in Emory County, Utah. 
The story gripped the entire state and then drew national attention. One man miraculously escaped, but all 27 of the others had finally been found or were declared dead by Sunday, December 23rd, two days before Christmas. On Monday, December 24th, an article in the Deseret News began, Today in church, watching his mother sob, Chris Pugilisi knew that this Christmas time was going to be different. His mother, Kathy, lost no one in the Wilburg Mine fire, but she, like others, felt the pain of those who did. Chris may not quite understand that the sadness that dampened his family's Christmas destroyed the holiday joy of 27 other families. Those families may never again celebrate Christmas without recalling the death of a father, a son, a daughter, or a brother. Close quote. More recently, a tragedy struck even a little closer to our family. Exactly one week before Christmas in 1994, a Sunday morning, a freak accident on Highway 128, nine miles northeast of Moab, Utah, plunged four teenagers to their deaths in the frigid water of the Colorado River. They were magnificent young people by every standard. A student body president, a valedictorian, two Eagle Scouts, a Laurel class president. Traveling that morning to sing at a missionary friend's homecoming in nearby Castle Valley. Two of the four were brothers, Joseph and Gary Welling, exemplary sons of our childhood friend and 20-year-old St. George schoolmate, Elaine Fossen Welling. This Christmas won't be as difficult for the Welling and Stewart and Adair families as 1994 was, but it will be difficult because the memories will return. It will reopen a deep wound, and every Christmas for the rest of their lives will undoubtedly carry some echo of that Sunday morning pain for those families. Now may I be even a bit more personal and in conclusion leave you with something considerably more cheerful than all of this has been so far. On the evening of December 23rd, 1976, my father underwent surgery to relieve the effect of osteoarthritis in the vertebrae of his back. Uh, vertebrae which were beginning to impinge upon his spinal cord. The surgery was successful, but near the conclusion of it, he suffered a major heart attack. Eight hours later, he suffered another one. From those two attacks, he sustained massive damage to a heart that was already defective from an illness suffered in his youth. By the time we finally got to see him, wired and tubed and gray and unconscious, it was mid-morning on December 24th, Christmas Eve. Magnificent timing, I muttered to the universe. Pat and I stayed at his side all day, as much for my mother's sake as for my father's. He was not going to live, and at age 60, she had never had to confront that possibility in their entire married life. As evening came along, we took her to our home. She needed calming, and our three little children deserved some kind of Christmas Eve. Pat has created a wonderful world of holiday traditions in our family, and we tried to do the Christmas Eve portion of those but it was a pretty joyless exercise, I'll be quick to admit. We tried to laugh and sing, but all that these children understood was that their grandmother was crying, that their dad was very sad, and that their grandfather was somewhere alone in a hospital, not free for the Christmas visit that had been planned. After hanging just a few of their mother's annual Christmas Eve gingerbread men, they uncharacteristically suggested that perhaps they should just go to bed a little early this year 
reassuring everyone that this was their choice and something they really wanted to do. You can imagine how convincing they sounded. About as convincing as our caroling had been. I gave my mother a blessing and convinced her to try to get some sleep. I stayed with Pat for a while, putting out a Christmas gift or two. And then I told her to hold the family together, as she has done all of our married life, and that I was going back to the hospital. There was obviously nothing I could do there. She knew it, and I knew it. But she also knew it was uh, my Santa Claus who was lying there alone. With all those tubes and IVs and monitors, and she said not a word to try to get me to stay. So at the hospital, I sat and walked and read and walked and looked in on my dad and walked. He would not, in fact, recover from all of this. I suppose everyone knew that. But the nursing staff were kind to me and gave me free access to him and to the entire hospital. A couple of the nurses wore Santa Claus hats, and all the nursing stations were decorated for the season. During the course of the evening, I think I checked them all out, every one, in every wing of the hospital, and sure enough, on every floor and in every wing, it was Christmas. You'll forgive me if I admit that somewhere in the early hours of the morning, I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. Why does it have to be like this, I thought. Why does it have to be on Christmas? Of all the times to lose your dad, did it have to be the night when dads are the greatest guys in the world? And gifts for little boys somehow appear that in later years would be recognized to be well beyond the meager Holland budget. Lying under that oxygen tent was the most generous man I had ever known. A Kris Kringle to end all Kris Kringles. And by some seemingly cruel turn of cardiac fate, he was in the process starting to die on Christmas morning. In my self-pity, it did not seem right to me, and I confess I was muttering something of that aloud as I walked what surely must have been every square inch of public and a fair portion of private space in the hospital. Not really sure how many people I startled that morning, but then and there, 2 or 3 a.m., I guess, in a quiet hospital, immersed as I was in some sorrow and too much selfishness, heaven sent me a small, personal, prepackaged revelation. A tiny Christmas declaration that was as powerful as any I have ever received. In the midst of mumbling about the very poor calendaring I thought the Lord had arranged in all of this, I heard the clear, unbroken cry of a baby. It truly startled me. I had long since ceased paying attention to where I was wandering that night. And only then did I realize I was in the maternity ward, somewhere, I suppose, near the nursery. To this day, I do not know just where that baby was or exactly how I heard it. I like to think it was a brand new baby taking that first breath and announcing that he or she had arrived in the world, the fact of which everyone was supposed to take note. It may have been just a baby saying it was time to eat and wondering where that comforting cuddle from a mother was. But wherever and whoever it was, God could not have sent me 
a more penetrating wake-up call. I felt a little like another who, in reply to his questions, heard the Lord declare, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You recognize that as God's statement with some sternness to Job. It was as if the Lord were saying, listen, this is the happiest night in the whole wide world for some young couple, Jeff. Some couple who may otherwise be as poor as church mice. Maybe this is their first baby. Maybe he is their own personal consolation in Israel. Perhaps the only consolation they have right now in what may be a very difficult economic life. In any case, they love him, and he already loves them. And think of the calendaring. Think of it. Born on Christmas Day. What a reminder that they have each other now and forever. Whatever happens, good times or bad, they have each other. Whatever pain may lie ahead, whatever sword may pierce their souls from time to time, they will be triumphant because the Prince of Peace was also born this same day once in Royal David's city. Temporary separation at death and the other difficulties that attend us as we all move toward that end are part of the price we pay for love in this world. The price we pay for the joy of birth and of family ties and the fun of Christmas together. Old Simeon, weathered and tried and tested old Simeon, had it right. And so did the morning stars and the shepherds and the angels who shouted for joy, praising God and singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Jeff, my boy, he seemed to be saying with that baby's cry, I expected more from you. If you can't remember why all of this matters, then your pitiful approach to Christmas is no more virtuous than the over-commercialization everyone laments these days. You need to shape up just a little. You need to put your theology where your Christmas carols are. You can't separate Bethlehem from Gethsemane. Or the hasty flight into Egypt from the slow journey to the summit of Calvary. It is of one piece. It is a single plan. It considers the fall and rising again of many in Israel, but always in that order. Christmas is joyful not because it is a season or decade or lifetime without pain or, with, or privation, but precisely because life does hold those moments for us. And that baby, my son, my own beloved and only begotten son in the flesh, born away in a manger with no crib for his bed, makes all the difference in the world, all the difference in time and eternity, all the difference everywhere, worlds without number, a lot farther than your feeble eye is apparently able to see. Well, I felt reprimanded. I can't fully describe to you what happened to me that morning, but it was one of the most revelatory Christmas experiences I have ever had or assume I ever will have. And it dawned on me that that could have been my young parents who were so happy that morning. I was a December baby, and my mother never wearies of telling me that that was her happiest Christmas ever. Perhaps the joy they felt that day at my birth was to be inextricably, inseparably, eternally linked with my sorrow at their passing. That we could never expect to have the one without the other. It came to me in a profound way that in this life no one can have real love 
without eventually dealing with real loss. And we certainly can't enjoy, rejoice over one's birth and the joy of living unless we're prepared to understand and accommodate and accept with some grace the inevitability, including the untimeliness on occasion of difficulty and trouble and death. These are God's gifts to us, birth and life, death and salvation, the whole divine experience in all its richness and complexity. So there lay my dad, the great gift giver. He who found bicycles and BB guns and presents of every kind somewhere. Now he was making his way out of the world, starting that journey on Christmas Day, on the wings of the greatest gift ever given. I thought of another father, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. True fathers and mothers were all alike, I realized, coming up with the best gifts imaginable at what is often terrible personal cost. And I'm obviously not speaking of material gifts or monetary costs. So I was mildly but firmly rebuked that night by the cry of a newborn baby. I got a little refresher course in the plan of salvation and a powerful reminder of why this is the season to be jolly and why any Christmas is a time of comfort whatever our circumstances may be. In the same breath I was also reminded that life will not always be as cozy as chestnuts roasting on an open fire or an unending splendor while we stroll walking in a winter wonderland. No, life will have its valleys and its peaks, its moments for the fall and moments for the rising in the lives of all of God's children. So now it's old Simeon's joyful embrace of that little baby just before his death that is one of the favorite images I try to remember at Christmas. I've repented since that night. In fact, I did some repenting there in the maternity ward. If you have to lose your dad, what more comforting time in all the world than Christmas? None of us would want those experiences for the Wilberg Mine families or the Moab Seminary students or a thousand other painful experiences some people have at Christmas. But even so, in the end, it is all right. It is okay. These are sad experiences, terribly wrenching experiences, with difficult moments for years and years to come. But because of the birth in Bethlehem and what it led to, these are not tragic experiences. They have a happy ending. There is a rising after the falling. There is life always, new births and rebirths and resurrection to eternal life. It is the joy of the stable, the joy of the maternity ward forever. If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died, Martha said to him once, probably in the same tone of voice I'd been using up and down the hallways of that hospital. If that arthritis just had not required surgery, there wouldn't have been any strain on his heart. If that conveyor belt had just been shifted a little, to the right or to the left, it wouldn't have started on fire. If there just hadn't been a small patch of ice on that particular stretch so close to the Colorado River. 
and on and on and on. Jesus has one answer for all of us. One answer to all the whys and what ifs and would haves and could haves and should haves of our mortal journey. Looking sweet Martha firmly in the eyes, he said for all in Rexburg and Orangeville and Moab to hear, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believeth in me shall never die. Yes, for me, the most important Christmas visitor of all may have been old Simeon, who, not in the absence of hard days and long years, but because of them, would sing with us tonight at the top of his voice, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. No more will sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He'll come and make the blessings flow far as the curse was found. Of this Christmas witness, I am a witness in the sacred and holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.